10101 Will the Starship is a Japanese space voyage simulation shooter adventure RPG that was released on PlayStation in November of 1997. The numbers in the title are an obvious reference to binary, and Will, which is awkwardly in quotation marks, is the name of the cosmic vessel you'll be commanding. The back of the case boasts that the game will feature a full voice system with real sound and gorgeous voice actors. One of the people listed here, Mayumi Iizuka, did the original Japanese voice of Misty, aka Kasumi, in Pokemon, amongst many other notable works. Also, there's an original song sung by Hiroko Shima. Sound Technology Japan got its start in the karaoke business, of all things, in the early 90s by putting music onto laser discs and outsourcing it to other companies. Initially located in Tokyo, the company was founded by Yumio Ozawa, who came from a family of talented people with an established playwright, scriptwriter, novelist for a father, and a well-known singer, actress, voice actress for a sister. Now, there is a person by the name of Yumio Ozawa that is credited as sound engineer on a large number of video games between 1988 and 1991, and given the time frame we have for this company, which starts somewhere around 1993, it is very possible that this could be the same person. But I can't confirm that, so I won't. Due to the success of his karaoke business, Ozawa got a niche to hop onto the latest trend. He decided to transition the focus of the company from karaoke to video games in 1996 with the first sound tech published and developed title, Satomi no Nazo, or The Mystery of Satomi. It's a 2D RPG about a boy and his dog that are trying to stop an evil cult from destroying the world. The theme song is performed by the same person that would later do the 10101 theme song, Hiroko Shima, and apparently there's a point in the game where you have to choose between two different characters for your team, which can change the story somewhat, so that's kind of neat. Otherwise, it seems pretty straightforward. One year later, Soundtech would develop its second and last video game, 10101 Will the Starship. Now, both of these games were publicly ridiculed in Japan, with players and critics pointing out that the inexperienced team behind these games clearly had no idea of what they were doing and should really have just stuck to karaoke. This was such the case that both titles were labeled as Grade A Soge, which is a term used in Japan to describe an embarrassingly bad game, or more accurately, a crappy game. 10101 in particular was lambasted by the public for a myriad of reasons including poor graphics, control, and plot. The title was picked apart for the strange in-game choices that this team of people, mostly only familiar with musical equipment, had made. Standards that had been developed by video games up until this point were not utilized by this amateur, would-be game company. And if you wanted to read some lists of grievances that people had with this, I'll put a few links in the video description. Everything is touched on and complained about here, like, for example, the small size of the manual, or the way that the game takes over 30 seconds after you save each time to congratulate you for saving. They're pretty funny and you should really check them out if you want a good laugh. Feeling the embarrassment of defeat, Yumio Ozawa pulled sound technology out of the mainstream video game development market, and oddly enough, in 1999, he launched two adult game-oriented subsidiaries of Soundtech called Night and Studio Taco, I'm assuming that the K is silent, who would both develop games to be published by sound technology. This short list of gyaroge, or gal games, which refers to games that are focused on attractive women and oftentimes in an erotic manner, was mostly comprised of visual novels. Between 1999 and 2003, there was Goodbye Smile, Minto, Feel the Faintly Scented Wind, Goodbye Smile 2, Enchanted by the Wings of Memory, Mahjong All Night, Sisters, Tell Me Master, and Sunburn, Survival with Idols on a Deserted Island. In 2001, Sound Technology was renamed SunTech Japan, and aside from publishing the adult visual novels, most of the focus was on music production for karaoke as SunTech Records. The company was never really able to garner any respect in the video game industry, as even these low-budget titles they were putting out were plagued with bugs and defects. Players often complained of the game's freezing and data being corrupted. With the decline of the karaoke boom, Suntech Japan was forced to file for bankruptcy in 2004, and most of their assets had been transferred over to Idea Factory, who was entirely responsible for the Spectral Force series, amongst many other titles. Alright, let's see if this game is as bad as they say.
Jumping into the game, we're thrust into a dangerous situation that requires an immediate response from you, the captain. The enemy is attacking, and you have no choice but to engage it. The stabilizers are locked, combat mode engaged, and the gills are changed? I'm assuming that means life support. We get a radar display featuring a simple breakdown of the enemy. It appears that we're being attacked by something called an Elephagri. It has 4,500 health points, 900 attack power, and 65 defense power. The enemy appears and immediately begins firing as we quickly stumble through this apparent tutorial. Three energy bars are displayed here on screen. On the top, we have what I believe is referred to as Veil Energy, which is essentially your ship's hit points. Then we have Main Energy, which is your overall fuel or power. And lastly, there's your Filling Energy, which refers to the charge and buildup of your current weapon. This meter fills alongside a corresponding timer on screen as you charge the weapon to fire. Fire too early, and you only do a little bit of damage. Fire too late, and the attack is cancelled altogether. You start the charge by pressing circle, and fire it again by pressing circle again. The goal is to get the charge as close to zero in order to do the optimum amount of damage, but you have to make sure that the aiming reticle is locked onto the enemy when you fire, otherwise you miss the shot. This can be pretty tricky as the enemy likes to move quickly across the screen, and as we'll soon find out, that agility can vary greatly. Going over the interface options, I'll first just establish that everything you do here is going to pull from your main energy. The top left button toggles your main guns, which is going to take whatever amount from your main energy that is displayed on the charge at the time that you choose to fire. The top right is healing, which requires that you hold the circle button and pull from your main energy to fill your veil, aka hit points. Middle left is secondary weapon, which is always going to be different depending on what you have equipped. The manual mentions something about the second armament playing a major factor in short range battles as opposed to long range battles, but I don't really recall observing any difference between battle ranges during my playthrough, so yeah, I don't know. Middle right is escape, and the success or failure of your escape attempt relies on an unseen speed stat applied to both you and your enemy. Bottom left is specialty, which behaves as a stat altering pool. There are four options to choose from, all of which use a lot of energy. The first is haste, and it costs 1000 units of energy. This raises your chances of a successful escape. The second is slow at 2000 units of energy, and this one slows the enemy down on screen, making it easier to hit them. At a cost of 4,000 energy units, Flare lowers the enemy's hit rate success. And finally, at 8,000 units of energy, you can increase the size of your aiming reticle, apparently making it easier to hit the enemy. I wouldn't know though, because I was never able to afford this. The final option on the bottom right is a sort of special escape that seems to always work, and full disclosure, I could not figure out the difference between both escape options, so I'm sorry to let you all down, everyone. Anyways, I should definitely mention that the music here is lifted directly from the orchestral suite, The Planets, by Gustav Holst. I got so excited when I heard it, since this outstanding piece of music has been one of my favorites for years. I put the record up there in my collection alongside my favorite albums about space. Each movement in the suite is based on a planet in our solar system and a corresponding astrological character, of which there are only seven, as this was written between 1914 and 1917. Mars, the bringer of war, is used perfectly here for the battle scenes. Through pulsating war drums, the scene is set to the anthem of destruction and chaos, as the main deck of the ship emits a red glow during battle mode, evocative of the scarlet planet and the inevitable bloodshed. The rest of the game features other planetary movements of the suite, and I'll play them as we go along. We fire the last successful shot and the enemy ship is vanquished. Combat mode is disengaged and we return to normal navigation. This guy informs us that we've acquired 666 VP, which acts as the currency as well as the experience points in this game, and I have no idea of what it stands for. We now finally get a bit of narrative as this guy <laughs> gives us an expository dump. Um, yeah. <laughs> Before moving on, I'll just address the elephant in the room. The hideously ugly elephant. This artwork is, uh, not to my taste. <laughs> Look, it's cool, everyone has a different opinion, but uh, I'm gonna side with the critics on this one. That is a turd man, and I don't mean like three in Irish, no, that is a, that is a turd man and that is a turd boy. <laughs> like, <laughs> they have two completely separate styles of illustration to represent the same character on one screen, and both of them manage to be awful in very unique ways, which is impressive. Just needed to get that out of the way so we can move on and you won't be confused when you don't hear me address the obvious issue upon later, equally hilarious examples. So anyways, the year is 24 something and these humans all belong to a space colony called Noah that was formed hundreds of years ago after planet Earth was either destroyed or just became inhospitable. The game doesn't make this clear. The main problems now facing this on-the-nose biblical reference of a space colony come in two major forms. 
One, the population is rapidly growing and resources as well as living spaces are quickly diminishing for the people of NOAA. The individual space stations spread throughout NOAA have all exceeded 200% intended capacity and things are not looking good. Two, the people of NOAA are all being terrorized by evil space creatures known as Chaos? Ka chaos? I'm thinking the translation is supposed to be Chaos. Q obligatory Sopfo reference. My mission is to kill chaos. 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 These monstrous aliens attack without any reason or warning and people are dying en masse. So the mission is to find a new planet for the people of Noah to live on and locate and destroy the source of chaos. This is you, by the way. I really like what you've done with the back of your cabeza. Now we get introduced to all the lovely people on board Will the Starship. This is Shinra. She's the deputy captain of the ship and she likes to brag about her academic accomplishments. Sendo is the pilot of Will and apparently he has tons of experience flying other ships. Martini is the ship's mechanic who also mentions that he has lots of experience as an astronaut. Yu is the communications operator, and uh, she has a lot of experience. She also feels the need to tell us that she is the oldest female here at the age of 21. Milka is the radar operator, and she's only 14 years old, but she asks that we don't treat her like a child. Dr. Hecuts is an old man at 76. He's a space archaeologist, but by his name I thought he'd be a space surgeon. He introduces himself with some empty pseudo-intellectualism. The past is the future that has already ended, and the future is the past that has not yet ended. And Tuesday comes after Monday, but before Wednesday? Saburo, which I guess translates to sustaining program, is the Dynamars S36000 computer, and it is here to help with any of our spaceship motherboard needs. Alright, so now that all the introductions and story setups and battle tutorials are over, we finally have a chance to take a look around the bridge and just dive into playing this game. What? Oh, a, a, a battle. Okay, I'm I'm ready for it. Let's let's do this. This guy is pretty fast, but I eventually take him down. Okay, now let's look around the bridge to see what we can... <sighs> what now? Okay, so I guess Milka located an unidentified object on the radar that is quickly approaching the ship. Shinra asks if we want to use the ship's arm tool to grab the item, and I'm like, yeah. You get an aiming reticle and a few seconds to fire a sort of tractor beam at a floating container that's moving in a curveball fashion. If you miss, like I did here, you lose out on getting the mystery item. Just like using the main gun during battle, it's best to try to wait until the last hundredth of a second to use the arm, if only because the item is closer and larger, which makes it easier to hit. If you successfully do so, Martini will tell you about the item you caught. It's always going to be one of many categories, which we'll get into in a bit, and the exact specifications are usually not immediately known and in need of being appraised. Alright, so let's try to explore around the bridge and see what we can do. Over here is- are you kidding me? Another battle, fine, okay. Alright, done. Now, let's- <sighs> And an item, okay. Let me do my thing. Dude, what the heck? Are you... <laughs> Come on. This encounter rate is awful. Sometimes you do have the option to avoid the battle altogether, but it still happens way too much. So I'll just go ahead and tell you how to deal with this. Click on you and select this radar jamming option. It prevents the enemies from finding you as often and cuts the encounter rate way down. I had to figure this out on my own after a lot of trial and error, and it was really frustrating. By the way, any mode you enter like this will be displayed in the top left corner. Oh, also, you can see the ship's main energy in the middle on the top. Okay, with that out of the way, let's finally take a look at what can be done in the command center. Each person you click on will offer a set of options, and let's start with you, since you already know one of hers. The first one here is for conversation, and all of the characters on board will have this. Usually it comes in the form of something like this, with commentary on how vast and lonely space is. I think it definitely adds to the immersion, and I appreciate that. The next button, which is also available to all characters, 
has them give you a systems check regarding the aspect of the ship they look after. This takes you to an upgrade menu, which allows you to upgrade individual parts of the ship by spending an outrageous amount of VP. That's a major complaint that I have with the game. I mean, like, the price tags are just way too high, but I'll get into that in a bit. For now, I just want to admire this really cool digital wireframe model of Will. I like how it highlights each part of the ship in red as you select it. It just looks so cool. The categories for upgradable attachments are the main guns, secondary weapons, shields, or veil, as the game calls it, rudder, energy pack, engine, radar, arm, and chip. You know, like, computer chip. I also like the dolphin emblem here. The design feels very Kojima. With you, you can also activate the radar jammer, as we know, and you can read emails sent from UHK. In this one, the Admiral was just like, yo, stop at space stations to refuel. See ya! Send to the pilot doesn't really have much to say. There's the check systems command. And something called Echo Drive, which allows you to lower the energy consumption of the ship while moving at a slower speed. The last thing you can do with him is pretty important. You can fill the veil energy of your ship by using the main energy. Moving over to Milka, who is currently very tired, you can have her activate an item search mode, which spends more of the ship's main energy to search for nearby floating items. You can have her put a map of sorts up on the screen, but I never really found any use for this. And you can initiate an enemy search mode, which is just going to raise the encounter rate, and I don't know why anyone would want to do that. Saburo just makes robot noises when you talk to it. And uh, just like the others, a system check isn't really necessary, since all of the ship's health is allocated to the veil meter. Like, to my knowledge, the individual components of the ship don't have their own health bars or status changes. I think the system check option for all of the characters is really just for the immersion, so that, I guess that's cool. Sabuto can appraise all of the items you find in space, depending on a percentage assigned to them, which determines the success rate. If it fails to appraise the item, you simply can't attach it to your ship. If it succeeds, you'll be able to compare the specs to your currently equipped attachment, and decide on whether or not you want to use the new one. You can also take a look at the equipment list and check out the details of each attachment of the ship, but I think this is a bit of a redundancy, as you're about to see, since you can also just do this with Martini, but with him, you can actually make changes to the attachments. The last thing you can do with this computer is access the same options menu found on the main screen of the game, and it's represented by this adorable little PlayStation console. In the options, you can change the cursor to one of these neat things, and you can adjust the colors of the menu, which I always appreciate seeing in games like this. Martini posits that there are still many dreams in space, and that is why it is so interesting. Now, with this guy, I was thrown for a loop. He shares some of the same options with Saburo and you, but there are a few differences. Just like you, Martini can upgrade individual parts of the ship, but the VP prices are all different from hers. Some are higher, and some are lower, so I don't get that. And just like Saburo, Martini can appraise the items you find, but he seems to usually have a better chance of successfully doing so. I'm not sure why this is a thing, and it leads me to speculate that maybe you can potentially lose characters later in the game. I really don't think that's the case, though. Unfortunately, I think this might just be bad game design due to lofty ideas by a karaoke company. Sorry, Suntech. Most importantly, Martini can equip your new attachments should you want to. This menu lets you take a look at the specifications of the attachments in your inventory, and gives you the opportunity to compare and contrast different stats like damage output, charge time, energy consumption, etc. Shinra, at 18 years old, is just now learning that if you stand for a long time while working, your back will hurt. Are you ready for more redundancies? With Shinra, you can look at the items with a slightly different interface from the item list that Sabado allows you to access. Cool! I'd like to speculate that this offers a visual of the upgrade tree for each item, showing what improvements are made at each level, but I honestly doubt that that's the case. Okay, so with Shinra, we can also access the ship's database, <sighs> which lets you look at the items again. <laughs> Only this time, you can look at the exact amount of time into your game that you found each item. Gee, what a stupendous idea! I HATE YOU, SHINRA! Okay, but here's a good one. With Shinra, you can self-destruct. <laughs> I love that. But unfortunately, it's pretty anticlimactic. Speaking of which, whenever you die, you get this same uneventful cut to the main screen. No explosions, no screams, no snack. Finally, we have Dr. Hecuts, who doesn't seem to want to be bothered. With him, you can click on this little coffee cup and put everything on the ship to sleep, which I believe just acts as an overglorified pause button, since no healing occurs during this. With the Doctor, you can pull up a list of the ship's components, but before you assume that I'm just going to complain about this, I will say that at least he gives well-spoken explanations of each part, so that actually helps. He can also appraise the attachments, just like Saburo and Martini, but let's just move on. 
I think it would be remiss of me to not mention the obvious Star Trek inspiration here. I get the sense that there is a genuine love and admiration for the series shown through imitation. The way all the individual characters on the bridge serve their purpose, the design of the projectiles and enemy ships, the shaking screen and red aura during combat mode. For all the complaining I might do about this game, this is something that I feel should be commended. It doesn't feel like a heartless plagiarism. Instead, I feel like the effort put into all of this, flawed as it may be, comes from a place of sincere passion. The president of Suntech, Yumio Ozawa, was one of the main writing forces behind this game, and his appreciation for Gene Roddenberry's love letter to space exploration is apparent. I just wanted to point that out. Alright, so let's take a look at a different screen for a change and observe the travel mode. Press X and you're taken to a top-down exterior view of Will the Starship. The control is bad. The control is very, very bad, everyone. <laughs> the ship is constantly moving forward and you can't stop it. In order to turn, you have to place the cursor in the direction that you want the ship to face and hold circle as you wait for it to very slowly rotate. Directional buttons? Psh, nah. Shoulder buttons? <laughs> Heck no. Why would you ever utilize those smelly parts of the DualShock? This is the premier way to travel, baby! It doesn't help that you're often moving through narrow corridors of asteroids, and if you get stuck on one of them, you have to slowly turn away from them in the exact opposite direction while you watch your main energy deplete even faster. And now, because you're moving in the wrong direction, you're likely to get stuck on something else. See an item or an enemy? You're probably just gonna have to miss it because you can't turn fast enough to get it. I'm thinking that maybe upgrading the rudder to the ship or getting a new one might change this, but I'm not sure about that, and either way, it shouldn't be this hard to control in the beginning of the game. Sometimes I would be low on the ship's main energy and in desperate need of stopping at a space station to refuel, but because of my trajectory, I just kept doing big circles around the station and I couldn't get to it. Speaking of which, yeah, space stations are scattered throughout the map, and you will need to stop at them. You get a static background image with varying degrees of Liddeller, and a welcoming agent that facilitates your visit. One of them is a stone cactuar, which I appreciated. Here, you'll replenish your ship's main energy using VP, appraise your items at 100% success rate also using VP, and save, which honestly I'm surprised doesn't also cost VP. The save screen is pretty funny. It forces you to sit through this long musical bit, and then has the audacity to congratulate you at the end. The VP issue is, in my opinion, the largest flaw in the game, even more so than the control during travel. It costs every penny you have to refuel the ship, and you'll never have enough to appraise anything at the space station. You'll certainly never have enough to upgrade any of your parts either. You might be thinking, oh, we'll just grind. That's the problem though. Any grinding that you do is gonna cut way into your main energy due to the basic cost of movement, and way more so, the need to refill your hit points after each battle, no matter how good you think you are. So then you refuel your main energy at the space stations using VP, otherwise you die. Now, even after grinding, you see zero progression because you can't upgrade anything. To make matters worse, enemy placement is highly unbalanced, so even if you stick to the beginning area to try and grind, chances are high that you'll face some way overpowered enemy that can take you out with one hit. Shame on you, Suntech, shame! As far as the story is concerned, there really wasn't much to go on until I found this black hole and went through it. We came across this giant floating gate thing, and Dr. Hecutz rambled on and on about an ancient civilization that he had been researching for years and now believes that this is connected. It's an interesting direction to take, and I would have loved to have seen it through had I been able to get any further in the game during my several attempts. I found a few interesting looking stills that occur later in the story, so it looks like things do happen here and there, and I wouldn't mind watching someone that has actually taken the time to master these mechanics play through the whole thing. And if you're wondering whether or not these characters in the story ever feel fleshed out, I would lean on the side of no, but we do get just a few moments of personality nuance that color things in a bit. This scene where Dr. Hecutz falls asleep and Shinra wakes him up by tugging his ear made me laugh a lot. It goes on for so long. <laughs>
Despite the lack of sheer content, the overall narrative is strengthened by the caliber of voice acting. I think a lot of the budget for this title was spent there, especially considering it's one of the main things advertised on the back of the case. If you go through the list of voice actors in this game, you'll end up getting sucked into a rabbit hole of branching anime paths. For example, Akira Ishida did the voice of Yase in Outlaw Star. Gene Starwind has a lust and passion for outer space. He spends his whole life in the slums while he watches other people get the chance to take off and leave everything behind. And then one day, it happens for him. Many of you probably share the same memories I have of coming home from school and watching the series on Toonami, or staying up late and watching it on Adult Swim. Very simply put, it's a show about a small group of individuals traveling through space that has stuck with me for a long time. By no means am I suggesting that I'm referencing some obscure anime. If you want that, you can go to Kenny Lauderdale's channel, and I strongly suggest you do. But sometimes I feel that this show gets swept under the rug and labeled as a Cowboy Bebop knockoff. And while I love that as well, this one is actually very different. I'd go so far as to say that this series is largely responsible for my own fascination with space travel. It does such a good job of poking at the imagination and inciting fantasy. It's meditative. It's dreamy. It's daydreamy. I'm talking about it right now without having watched it for years, and now that's all I want to do. It's so easy to get caught up in all the frustrations that come with life, especially in regards to coexistence. Interacting with other people can be so exhausting, and daunting, and intimidating. It's more often than not that I feel like my words are just misunderstood, and people don't ever see me for who I am. It's a relentless cycle that we're all stuck in, and we have no choice but to keep doing it and try to stay sane in the process. I just, I start to lose it when I feel like everyone around me is content with the whole act. In a very broad, loosely constructed way that disregards things like oxygen, I look up at space and I see an escape. The thought of getting to leave this whole place and just float in isolation to go beyond any of the celestial bodies we've discovered is just so enticing. And to even add to that, there's the potential of discovering new places and living beings. It would be a meditative journey with countless possibilities. Just what the doctor ordered. So, to touch on how I relate this all to 10101, I don't mean to say that space, as the subject matter, inherently makes this game good. I just mean that the wonderment is there. It can be felt behind the intent of the developers, and I have to acknowledge that. It's a deeply flawed game, but there is a magic to it, and for that, I think it's worth a look over. If this ever got fan translated and received some tweaks to the VP system, you better believe that I would revisit it. 10101, Will the Starship, was hated upon its release, but I still feel that it has a lot of good. It has great music, some cool visuals, especially when you put the ship into warp drive to escape battle, or how the bridge transforms in and out of battle. The voice acting is good. <laughs> the weapons and attachments, as well as how they relate to the ship's performance, does offer deep RPG elements to the experience. The narrative has potential, and the overall attempt made by the developers proves to me that they wanted to make something that simply said, I want to go far. Thank you so much to all my wonderful Patreon friends that helped to keep this channel going. I owe you my heart and soul. Be nice to people. Bye.